Okay, guys, so we're going to get into an uh, interesting video where you're going to get to go ahead and think as if you were an administrative law judge sitting in front of, but raised up higher than, a social security disability applicant. And what's tricky about this is I'm going to kind of give you uh, a little bit of an understanding as to how I see the judge asking these very difficult questions. And when they ask these questions, they ask them very, very slowly, okay? And they do that because they want the claimant to hear it the first time, and they want to see the claimant's reaction as their brain is processing the information. So these are not just trick questions, but they're, they're claim killers. They're claim killers. It just is what it is. Let's get right to these questions. Uh, let's not waste any time here. Okay, first question that we're going to be going through on these claim killer uh, disability questions. Question number one. There is a gap in unreported earnings from this date to this date, right? So there's no earnings here, but there's earnings on the records here and earnings on the record here from the IRS. There's a gap in unreported earnings from this date to this date, and your doctor's records show you were injured while, dur uh, while working during that gap of a period of time. What type of work were you doing and for whom? Let me rephrase it. Let me do it again. There's a gap in unreported earnings from this state to this state. And your doctor's records show that you were injured while working during this gap. What type of work were you doing and for whom? Now, you know when a judge is asking this, they already know A, that even though you didn't have IRS earnings on record, you were absolutely working because they have some sort of evidence that shows that you were working under the table. Now, what is the gap? All right. So when you get the IRS earning, earnings records from, you know, uh, the IRS, they send them to the SSA. There's multiple documents, uh, detailed earnings query, certified earnings query, summary earnings query, and new hire query. And then there's a few additional ones, but those are the main four. When you get those documents... They'll show you specifically where somebody was working, working, working. There's a block of work, and then there's a missing block of time where there's no work, and then they're working again. During that gap period, judges know to ask about what the person was doing, okay? Especially if somebody is in a career path where they're just missing some work there, or they were a hard worker their whole life. You know, if it was one of those things where it was a cluster bleep where you had a job here, a job there, and there were jobs <clears throat> all over the place, you never really earned much at a job then the judge isn't going to be asking this question. But if you've been working at jobs, kept a job, then all of a sudden there's a gap. That's going to be something that piques the judge's interest. Now, why is the gap there? Um, money or something happened in the industry where you can make more money off the financial record. Okay. Why do they go back to, you know, and why did somebody, you know, get off of payroll jobs and then go back to payroll jobs? It's almost usually about loans. Sometimes it's about legitimacy family members get on them about having a real job, but it's usually about car stuff, car loans, home stuff, home loans, stuff like that. Okay. What is the judge getting at when they ask this question? They are asking you whether or not you're going to lie on the record in front of a social security federal disability judge, because they know they've got you. They've got you because they have some evidence saying that you were in fact working. And now all they're waiting for you to do is be disingenuous and either give them a made up answer or basically a quasi acceptable answer or the truth. Now, the truth almost always comes out with that question in a very like, you know, look, this is what I did. This is what I actually did. Here's what I was doing. Didn't work out. I had to go back to work. That's the truth. A quasi truthful answer sounds like. I tried some things here. I tried some things there. None of it worked. And then a bold-faced lie is I just couldn't work during that period because of my impairment starting. Bold-faced lie. Bold-faced lie. Okay. What's question two of these claim killer questions? Question two. Why didn't you go to the emergency room when that happened? Now that, right, that word that could be filled with anything, right? When you, when you had a seizure, when you uh, had, you know, a car accident, when you had this, when you had that, whatever. But why didn't you go to the emergency room when that happened? The person 
could hate emergency rooms. The person could have had drugs in their system. The person could be on the run from facial or name recognition systems. The person could not have insurance and just yo-yos in and out. The person could be used, uh, you know, for basically, you know, they could be upset because doctors treat them like a deadbeat and they just don't want to go back to that situation. Um, you know, the, the person could be afraid of more bad news, right? Now, let me say this. Okay. I've represented a lot of comeback cancer patients where the cancer went away and then it came back. I've represented a lot of women of the night getting a new diagnostic that they caught something else claimants, uh, men who use drugs to meet their physique desires, right? Um, what I need you to understand is that a lot of these people that are out there who are, you know, disabled or about to become much more aware of how severely impaired they are. No news is good news. That's just it. The more news you're getting in the medical field, it's usually crap news that you don't want to hear because it means you're worse than you actually were before. What the people who win and the hospitals that sell the win don't tell you, meaning like the people who beat cancer and the hospitals that sell that they beat cancer and they beat them with that hospital, what they won't tell you is that their files are pretty much filled uh, with human names that don't belong to anyone anymore. There's a lot more losses. There's a lot more people who didn't win. And then those names that are in their records, they just don't belong to anybody anymore because at that point, the person's deceased. Let's go on to the next question. This is question number three. This is what a judge would ask. Who did you share your medication with? It's a tough one. It's a tough one because at the end of the day, what they're really asking you is, how much are you willing to lie on the record to try and serve your own ego? Now, you know that they've got something on you. You know that they have something in the record that says, hey, this person is not taking all their medication. Hey, this person is selling some of their medication. Hey, this other person in their life somehow has access to the medication, is using it. You know, somewhere in the record, the judge has you, okay? They uh, it could be something where a doctor does a, a pill count and they fail the pill count. Uh, could be where something is hinted at, always running out. Like the claim would say, I'm always running out by the end of the month for basically a day-to-day -day medication to the doctor. That'll raise the question. Uh, could be a cop pill count on the record. They'll pull out all the stuff. They'll say, okay, there were this many of this drug on this day of that month You know, on their report. Uh, you could have told your doctor, your mom is taking your pills when she needs one. Your dad is, or is your boyfriend or girlfriend, whatever you, uh, could come to the hearing with the new iPhone and the judge is wondering how somebody with no income is affording a new iPhone. That one all comes down to what do they have and how do you find out as quickly as possible what they have? But the judges know how to play this game. They won't ask a question that they can't follow up with another question before they tell you what they have in the record. So the way it works is judges will never release the information that they have in the first question. It's rare before the second question, but usually after the second question, the judge will say, cause I'm referring to, you know, uh, 15 F page three thirty two for your counselor. And what they're saying when they say that, is they're saying, here's the giant folder it's in, 15F medical record folder. Here's the page number where it's at. And this is what I'm citing to for the purposes of this counselor. Go read it. And let's see how your claimant does with this question. That's what's happening. When that happens, that's what's happening. Question number four. When was the last time that you used narcotics? This question is like the bane of my existence. I just, I have, I have lost claims with this question. I will admit it. I have lost claims with this question because the problem with this question is that we are assuming, okay, that in the record that we read that was as up to date as it was inside the ERE file as it was, that the last day in there at the moment at the hearing that we are looking at essentially that record and that that's it. That's all the judge has. That's all I have. That's all the claimant has. That's it. That's what we're going into the hearing with. But 
I have been in hearings where the judge will say, oh, you know what? I don't see this medical record entered into the exhibit list. I'm going to go ahead and enter it in now into the exhibit list. And then all of a sudden we have a new medical record entered into the F folder that has a newer date than the last date that my claimant just testified was the last time that they used and abused narcotics. Does it happen? It does. Is there anything I can do about it? I can warn the claimant ahead of time. But you know as well as I do, the claimants, look, look, here's the deal. If the claimant remembers the last time that they used and abused, that's a good sign in the sense of they know when it was, but it's a bad sign in the sense of it was very recent. If the claimant doesn't know the last time they used and abused, that's a better sign because realistically it was at least past the four to six month period mark. Okay. Which means that you got a shot in hell of saying to the judge, well, you know, the claimant's memory, yada, yada, yada. Okay. All right. Does the claimant, does the claimant remember what you talked about before the hearing? Does the claimant even realistically know when the last time was? If they can't, right, then how should they react to that question? Does the judge have the actual last time or did they miss the actual last time? And the brief writer post-hearing will update the judge once they find something new. They email the judge with bullet points. That's how it works when they're writing the final brief. Does the claimant realize what is at stake with this question? Take a moment. Think about it. Does the claimant actually understand what is at stake in that very moment with that question? They never do. They never do. Even if you explain to them that it is a claim killer, even if you explain to them that they could give a correct answer and the judge might think they're lying because the record says something else and a doctor got it wrong, they don't realize the odds that they're facing with answering this question. That's how bad and how scary this question is. Number five. Why do you have two mailing addresses, but no address that you live at as a homeless person? Seems not that bad of a question. Like, okay, you got two living addresses, but, uh, you know, why don't you have a domicile? Why don't you have a place where you live? Well, maybe it's a trailer that they live in or a garage or side room, detached shed maybe. But what is on record is in the woods, that they live in the woods. How far into the woods is your campsite, Mr. So-and-so? How long does it take you to walk that distance, Mrs. So-and-so? How do you get your food back there, Mr. So-and-so? What do you need to climb over to get to your camp, Mrs. So-and-so? Do you have running water? Do you have power at this camp, Mr. So-and-so? Where do you keep your 1987 registered car that you have a license and you're driving currently in the woods, Mr. So-and-so? Why do you have a, then this one, this one nipped me recently. This one nipped me recently. So if you're listening, this one's important. Why do you have a doctor in Puerto Rico who delivered their medical records to your Orange County physician, Mrs. So-and-so? Yeah, with that one, uh, just to, just to clarify something, when somebody says they're living in a particular state, but they're homeless, and then they're actually living in Puerto Rico or South America or overseas in Europe or whatever. That complicates things because all of a sudden, why were you down there? And the problem is the medical records will then show, right, essentially how many visits, how long they've been treating them, all of these things that could be a claim killer, if you will, okay? Okay. Uh, I hope you guys enjoyed these questions. These questions come from literally being in this field for, you know, 15 years through the law firms and then 20, 20 years total through other stuff. But, uh, you know, about five years of working for other firms and then 10 years of owning my own law firm. And uh, I, I got to tell you, nobody else on the Internet will be able to deliver to you questions like that. They might know them. They might know the answers, but they're not at 1 a.m., 1.35 a.m., giving you a video outlining it. So please remember, don't be stingy with your likes. You've got a finger, most of you do that are watching. Use it to give me those likes because this video will then help more people with understanding these claim killer questions. Now, some of you will be like, well, I don't want other people to know 
well, how to how to go ahead and handle these types of questions. You don't until you realize your family member who doesn't have a perfect squeaky clean path and this wonderful I was a princess past, right? to disability benefits. You, you'll realize very quickly that when that person who is important to you, even though they're not a perfect person, has to face one of these situations, and the only thing they need to get their life rolling in the right direction is that disability check in health care, then you will realize that you should give people a chance to have the knowledge to literally face highly trained, highly experienced attorneys who have passed into becoming the next level being federal judges. To give them this opportunity is something we should want for all of them. Good or bad, good or bad, the judges will know, trust me. They've seen far too many claimants. They've met too, far too many people to not know, okay? Guys, please remember to like. Use that like button. Uh, go ahead and subscribe. Hit the all. Uh, if you want to leave a review, I love waking up to those five stars, but you can leave whatever review you like. Uh, Disability Resolution uh, Law Firm or Disability Resolution Florida in Google. You just type those things in. I will catch you guys at the next video where we're going to be talking about basically which cities are most likely to be ruined upon the occurrence of the trust funds running out of money. I will see you guys in about, I would say, five minutes, just five minutes, and uh, we'll go from there. Please stay safe. We've got two more videos tonight. That's the next one. I'll catch you soon, and uh, we'll go from there. Thanks so much. Bye-bye, guys. Bye-bye.